Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Shelly Anand. I am a supervising staff attorney at Tahari Justice Center here in Atlanta. Um, this is our second uh, training presentation as a part of our uh, virtual summer intensive on uh, immigration law and immigrant rights here in Georgia. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, Christina Ituralde Thomas with us. She's a very good friend of mine. We've known each other for, God, seven, eight years now. Yeah, at least. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, and she is queen of all things uh, unaccompanied minors. So we're really, really lucky to, to have her with us today. I'm going to quickly read you a little bit about Christina. Um, Christina is the managing attorney of the Atlanta Field Office for Kids in Need of Defense or KIND. Prior to joining KIND, uh, Christina worked at the Latin American Association as a staff attorney representing unaccompanied minors. She also worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigrant Justice Project and Latino Justice PRLDEF, formerly uh, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund, defending the rights of immigrants in the United States through impact litigation. Uh, Christina is a graduate of University of California, Hastings College of Law, and she's admitted to practice law here in Georgia and in New York. Uh, so thank you, Christina, for, for presenting today. And without further ado, we'll let you go ahead and get started. Thank you, Shelley. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. I see that people are trickling in. Um, so I do want to invite everybody to put yourselves on video. Um, it makes it a little bit more intimate to see each other, um, more importantly than to see me or for me to see you, but just for you guys to interact a little bit more personally. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity um, just to be in the space with you, especially in these very crazy times that we're living under. Um, but it's really cool to be able to do this virtually with all of you this morning. Um, I'm going to screen share, so I may not even be able to see many of you as the presentation goes on. Um, but I do want to welcome you to put in the chat any questions as we go. And I promise that we're going to also open it up to Q&A once I'm done with the formal presentation. And as you, ch you know, chat any questions during the presentation, I'll do my best to address it while I am presenting. But if I don't get to it right away, just know that we will get to it at the end. And if for some reason I forget, you can always um, re-ask the question verbally at the end of the presentation as well. So I'm going to just go ahead and start screen sharing so you can see my PowerPoint. And Christina, I'll keep track of the questions. And I think just to kind of help um, the flow, um, why don't we save the questions for maybe the last 15 minutes or so, if that works for you. That does work for me. And hopefully everyone is able to see the presentation now. Um, so can you just let me know, Shelly? I can't yeah, see. Yeah, like we can see it. Does that, okay. can everyone else see it? Thumbs up. Excellent. Um, so we're just going to do a quick overview of representing unaccompanied minors in immigration proceedings here in Georgia. And I'm going to really, I think, only cover the very um, high level um, issues involved in all of this. This isn't going to be a deep level training or more um, you know, training on any piece of this. You know, we try and aim to have advanced trainings designed for each type of remedy that we'll be going over. Um, they sometimes happen, um, you know, maybe once to twice a year, and then every month we do something very similar to this presentation to anybody who's really interested in getting involved with our local office. Um, so let's get started. What does KIND do? Um, KIND protects kids who arrive in the United States alone. We aim to provide lawyers to help them navigate the immigration system. At the same time that we do that work, we advocate for policies that protect their rights and well-being. Um, so we do have a policy team, um, we refer to them as PAC, uh, Policy Advocacy and Communications. And that team actually is constantly working on the Hill um, to really push forward um, you know, legislation and other um, administrative policies that could help children through all of the system that we're about to learn a little bit more about. We also um, have a pretty robust social service team across the country. Each field office now has a social service coordinator. And we actually just hired an additional um, leader to the team to help provide training across the board to all our social service um, coordinators across the country. Um, you know, the work of the social services team is so vital um, to the work that we do on the legal side. 
um, because all of our children um, have overcome trauma or other types of issues, um, you know, in their journey to arrive to the United States. Um, you know, we see a lot of uh, history of abuse, history of violence, um, that in addition to any kind of immediate traumas that they might have experienced along the way. So it's really, really important that we address the social service needs of the kids so that they'll be able to focus on their immigration case and defending themselves as best as possible in that process. Um, we have 10 field offices across the country. Um, you know, we, we actually kind of form a U-shape around the United States. Um, we're located in Seattle, California, Texas, here in Georgia, and then up the East Coast, we have offices in UC Virginia, New York, and New York. And I'm sure I missed some along the way there, um, but we, we try and, and do what we can in, in the jurisdictions where we're present. Um, you know, we, we recognize um, so in some communities, we have partners that are very strong allies and unaccompanied minor work. In some cities like here in Atlanta, we might be the only um, organization that's solely dedicated to this issue. Um, so it's really important um, wherever we are to, you know, really help others understand sort of the, the nature of the problem and to do something about it. So this is one of the reasons why I'm so happy to be here to share this information with all of you. Now, how do we do the work that we do? We have a two-part um, programming uh, in each of our offices where we do some direct representation work, and we also have a pro bono mentoring model. And we're a little bit different than some other organizations who might do co-counseling engagements with their pro bono attorneys. We are uh, primarily mentoring. So we let the pro bono attorneys really lead the way. Um, you know, they're the ones who will represent the children and make key decisions. We're there to just inform them and make sure that they are navigating all of those decisions with all the information possible. So how does our pro bono model work? In more detail, children are referred to our kind offices. We screen them for eligibility. We match the children um, you know, with attorneys who might be able to help them with you know, whatever remedy we think might be the best course. And again, the attorneys from there take, take on the responsibility of also identifying further remedies and whatnot if something more were to happen in the child's life or maybe we didn't catch everything during you know a singular intake so it's really important um, to match them with an attorney who's going to be able to help represent them fully and then like i said before we mentor the attorneys through the duration of the case now what does this mean um, as far as impact you know we've seen that when we um, you know, represent, or one of our pro bono attorneys represent a child through the durations of their proceedings to the end, 98% of those cases see success. Um, so that's a really important <laughs> um, statistic um, to keep in mind. And I think that's generally true. Any, any immigrant who is fully represented, who has somebody by their side, is gonna have a remarkably increased chance of winning their case. Um, you know, so far, find over the years, we've, um, trained, um, similar to, to everyone here on this call, um, over 41,000 individuals. Um, we partner with 585 law firms, uh, legal departments, and law schools across the country. And so far, Children River's time has been around 17,776 children. Um, these numbers are going to be important as we go because I'm going to also um, show you what's happening here locally. Um, so before I do that, though, who is an unaccompanied child? Um, you know, a UAC, often referred to as a UAC, and under law, it's actually considered unaccompanied alien child is how they're um, referred to under statute. We either say UAC, UC, um, or unaccompanied. Um, a child who is a UAC is a child who, at the time that they were apprehended when they entered the country, they have no lawful immigration status. They were under the age of 18 and they have no parent or legal guardian in the United States or no parent available to provide care and physical custody to them at the time of apprehension. That distinguishing thing that I just mentioned at the time of apprehension is going to be really important as we go on as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, now, to give you a sense of who we represent, this is just a quick snapshot of our kind clients and the population that we serve. Um, you know, I adjusted the age range this morning because our initial slide said two to 17 and a half. Um, in our office, we've seen children less than one years old, you know, children that just crossed being months old um, when they entered the country with their maybe teenage mom. 
both of those um, uh, children then become kind clients. So that you understand the nature of how they arrive. Um, we've also seen children as young as three or four years old um, arriving um, literally without any caring relative because they got separated along the journey. So that's not uncommon as well for a child to appear at the border without, um, without an immediate family member or anyone to know. Um, in one case, we had a child who was four years old who um, got separated from their grandmother at a shelter in Mexico. And um, by the kindness of somebody's heart, um, you know, he made it to the border, um, you know, being brought. And then we still wonder a lot of the time what might have happened to that child, um, you know, in the hands of somebody that was a complete stranger. Um, but these things happen just to give you some sense of what's going on. Um, as far as gender ratio, um, we say across time, it's about two thirds boys and one third um, girls, as far as clients that we see. And the national origins for our local field office, um, these numbers reflect our local office, El Salvador, um, on the lower end. Guatemala is probably the largest of the um, uh, countries that we most commonly serve, being El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And many of you probably um, know that these three countries are referred to as the Northern Triangle countries in Central America. That's where a majority of our clients are fleeing from. And it may be because of the nature of the system as well, that that's why they're coming from these three countries primarily. But just to give you a, a clear indication, you know, we have no limitations as to who we serve, you know, by country or anything like that. We, we serve anyone, um, any child who is unaccompanied from any country. So we have seen children from Jamaica, Nigeria, Mexico, Senegal, and Sudan. And again, these numbers reflect our local field office. Each kind office has a different makeup and a different um, percentage of you know, who they are serving locally. Um, as you know, the diaspora in the United States, that really affects you know, who we see. Um, then as far as languages are concerned, you know, we, uh, we would say that the majority of our clients are usually um, monolingual Spanish speakers or you know, trying to become bilingual with English. Um, and we're seeing more and more children who speak indigenous languages, Mayan indigenous languages, um, that are often referred to by our clients as dialects. Um, so in many cases, we also have to use interpreters in our office to be able to communicate with our children. Um, we've had to get interpreters for different languages like Wolof and um, uh, uh, Arabic, um, Sudanese Arabic, um, Vietnamese. So, Many of the children that we see, um, oftentimes, you know, even we, that our team is fully bilingual um, for the most part, you know, we often have to rely also on interpreters. Um, so why are kids coming to the United States? Um, this is really, I think, an important slide and, and something that probably many of you are probably very much aware of. Um, you know, the children that we see are often escaping gang violence forced recruitment into gangs. Um, you know, and we distinguish those two things because you know, there, there are really um, strong trends to recruiting young men and even young women um, into the gangs. Um, but it's not always related to the violence that they might be experiencing. So those two things are very uh, much, maybe hand in hand, but two separate categories. Severe abuse by family members or non-family members, domestic violence, you know, um, you know some of our, our young um, children are getting into relationships um, themselves and they experience domestic violence at the hands of their partners, sometimes of the same age or sometimes much older than them. Um, we have gender-based violence, um, lack of uh, proper caregiver, abandonment, neglect, extreme poverty, trafficking, and you know another big issue or a big reason children come is to reunify with family members who may have come before them. So a parent um, may have left them behind with a grandparent. It's a really common fact pattern that we see. Children are really interested in just coming to live with their parents. Um, you know they reach a certain age, their grandparents are getting old, and they really want to be um, reunified with their parents. So that's another large reason why children come to the United States. Um, again, why are they coming? And I'm going to refer again to the Northern Triangle region. You know, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras has some of the highest homicide rates in the entire world. Um, and if you've seen any um, documentaries about the region, any any um, reports about the region that you might have read, you know, this is 
something to take particular note of, right? So the homicide rates that you see, they're, they're not just, you know, a generic statistic. Um, people, communities live among these um, situations and see the violence in their own homes and in their streets, right? So children who grow up in these areas are often just seeking refuge, just a safe place to be away from all of that. And that's, you know, a huge reason why children come to the U.S. Now, numbers-wise, I think it's really important um, to sort of keep an eye on this. And, you know, a lot of the time, some of the arguments against accepting unaccompanied minors have to have to do, especially with this slide, you know, you hear people that say, gosh, you know, we can't open the floodgates to um, these children coming in. And I think that, you know, you have to understand the numbers and the dynamics um, to kind of better place your arguments within that space. Um, you know, in 2012, um, you know, that was thought of as a peak year. Um, and then since 2012 to now, we've seen, you know, some additional things happen um, of children trying to get, come to the United States and flee the situations in their home countries. Now, any time that you see kind of a less handy number, just to give you a sense, and, and you know, this is just really a guess um, by many of us who, who work in this field, it really isn't uh, necessarily related to a lack or, you know, a lesser need to escape the violence. Um, these are key years um, in, in between where, you know, the United States and Mexico, for instance, often um, enter agreements to stop the flow of migration, to stop um, the people coming through. But then you keep seeing people come despite all of that, right? Um, and that's because the nature of the problem is so huge in their home country. So until we address the root causes, um, in home countries, we're going to continue to see these humongous migration flows, and that's not going to stop unless we do something really drastic about, you know, the poverty, the extreme poverty, the extreme violence that these countries are suffering. Now, regionally speaking, and I know that many of you are probably really interested in finding out what's happening in Georgia in particular. Why is Georgia, um, you know, an issue for unaccompanied minors? Um, so. Here is a chart just to give you a sense of the numbers of children who are released to sponsors in our state by fiscal year. And fiscal year means that it begins in October. And October. So this captures the, the number of children that are, these are documented numbers, obviously the ones that are um, actually apprehended at the border, treated as an accompanied minor, and then released to sponsor um, through a much more involved process. Um, these are the numbers that we're seeing year by year. So it's never the case that we see less than a thousand children arriving in Georgia since, you know, at least 2014, um, and in some years closer to two, or even venturing upwards to 3,000 children arrive in our state each year. Who, by the very nature of this number, means this is the number of children that actually need assistance with their immigration cases every year. And you know, it, it's never going to be the case that we're going to reach all of these children um, through pro bono services, but you know, it's something to keep in mind. Um, you know, why is there a need for time? Why is there a need for representation? This is part of the reason. I also include the numbers for Alabama because um, Alabama um, is a jurisdiction that actually has to come to immigration court here in Atlanta. So just to give you a sense, we're talking about kids in Alabama also who need help in the immigration court here in Atlanta as well. So. Um, while our office, we try to limit our geographic scope to the metro area, um, you know, it's, it's not infrequently the case that we'll get a referral from the state of Alabama or, you know, parts of Georgia that we don't necessarily reach through our geographic um, reach. All right, and I'm going to stop sharing just for a second because I want to make sure that everyone is awake and doing okay. Um, if that worked or not. Let's see. Can I stop sharing the screen? Yes. So, hi, everybody. <laughs> I just know that that was a lot of information that I just threw your way. Um, I want to make sure that anyone has any questions. I, I wanted to check the chat. And when I'm screen sharing, just so you know what's happening, I'm not able to see the screen where all of you are wonderfully participating and, and the chat. So, um, I'm glad everyone is still here and still awake. Um, I will continue sharing the screen now. We'll go on um, with the system here. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? And Shelly, can you verbally tell me yes, everything is good? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Go back to 
slideshow mode. Okay, so who's who in juvenile immigration? Um, so for those of you who are probably interning at an immigration um, nonprofit, um, you might already be very much familiar with some of this part. Um, for those of you who may have never before or not yet worked with children, you may be less familiar with um, the left and bottom part of this chart, which is HHS and the state courts. Um, now, I think most of us who work on immigration matters understand that the Department of Homeland Security has a lot to do <laughs> with the goings on of immigration. Um, you know, we have USCIS who um, does a lot of the applications and petitions um, that people request to migrate or immigrate fully to the United States. We have ICE, who's the enforcement arm of DHS, and you know, everybody has seen images of ICE going into communities and picking up people, stopping you know, Greyhound buses sometimes, going into people's homes sometimes to raid or, you know, I guess, carry out their enforcement actions um, at workplaces and whatnot. And we have CBP, and CBP at the border, at least when it comes to uh, children, we see that they're the ones that are usually um, empowered with that ability to designate a child as unaccompanied. So a lot of the time when we, we have paperwork that says like this child is an unaccompanied minor, it's usually a CBP officer that's made that decision. DHS also interestingly provides the trial attorneys that you see that represent the government in immigration court and also the asylum officers who um, adjudicate asylum applications. All of that is based in the Department of Homeland Security at one of these sub-agencies. You also might be more familiar with DOJ, the Department of Justice who runs the immigration courts. And for those of you who don't know, um, the immigration court is actually formally called the Executive Office for Immigration Review. Um, you know, it's definitely um, an administrative court. And you know, under the Department of Justice, we also have the Board of Immigration Appeals. So if a decision is made by an immigration judge, then it goes up to the Board of Immigration Appeals to be reviewed. And it's important to understand that, you know, the primary actor within the Department of Justice, at least in the immigration context, is that immigration judge who makes so many, um, you know, decisions that really affect the fates of, you know, immigrants and children. Um, so it's important to understand that that's, that's the department where all of this falls under. But then when it comes to kids that are unaccompanied, usually after they've um, encountered CBP, then the Department of Health and Human Services actually goes to work. Um, you know, usually the children are sent to ORR, Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelters that are located all over the country. And by the way, there's one opening here in the state of Georgia very soon. Um, and what happens at the shelters is the kids are, um, you know, in very nice terms, um, you know, they're held, but you know, this is another form of detainment. Um, the children are in these shelters. They're, you know, supposed to be treated um, in a child-friendly way. They're supposed to receive classes and psychological assessments and, you know, anything um, that would pertain to the child's well-being and, and care is actually the responsibility of ORR while they're at these shelters. I'm sure many of you have heard of some of the crises that have happened where the ORR, I think, has at times been unable to manage the, the degree of which we have children coming in and we have, you know, reports of sexual abuse sometimes happening at these shelters. That's not common and it's not overall, but, you know, it's definitely something to always be aware of the fact that if a child went through a shelter, you know, you want to ask those questions, you know, were you treated well? Did you get everything needed? Were you fed well? You know, did you have any negative interactions with other children or facility staff? Um, it's really important to be on the lookout for that. And within the Department of Health and Human Services, we have shelter workers, therapists, field coordinators. There's a lot of people that work within that system. Now, at some point, while the children are in these shelters, they are released to sponsors in different states across the country. Um, and then, at some point, um, if the child especially is going to be seeking a remedy that we're going to talk about later called special immigrant juvenile status, they might have interactions with the state courts in the state that they're released to, and they might have to deal with uh, sorry, juvenile court judges, guardian ad litem, um, or law enforcement, um, depending on the nature of their case. So um, that's why state courts might have something to do with the nature of the case that you're going to be confronting if you're representing an unaccompanied minor. 
um, in their immigration proceedings. So this chart is actually really helpfully something that EOIR has put together. So I just want to acknowledge this is not, you know, a, a chart that I made or that kind put together. Um, it's supposed to give you a sense of what happens to any immigrant's case. And um, much like an adult case, you know, children's cases follow the same process. Now, most of us, especially who work in Atlanta, know that um, at the beginning of this chart, that little box that says master calendar hearing, you know, in most of our cases, we should probably have that box repeated multiple times, right? You could have seen continuances. Sometimes our court is very disorganized and there's been just, um, you know, a lot of recalendering or cancellations of cases. And given COVID, we also have seen over the last couple of months a lot of cancellation of cases that are going to have to be reset again. So we might have to appear for master calendar hearings a number of times before we actually get to do an individual merits hearing before the immigration judge. Um, so this chart is a little bit, you know, inaccurate in that sense. Um, at some point, you might get an immigration judge decision. Um, sometimes you can get it in, in an immigrant child's case, even without getting a merits hearing, um, because sometimes, and as I'll explain later, you might be petitioning um, USCIS for relief, and that might actually terminate the proceedings or affect the immigration proceedings from going forward whereby hopefully you're you know, going to get a positive result and not need to go through all of this. Um, but just so that you understand sort of the, the flow of things, that is um, more or less what it looks like in immigration court. And remember, I said we're going to keep things a little bit generic here today. So I'm sorry for going a little bit fast um, and not covering everything here. But you know, this is another chart just to say the same thing as that last chart. Um, children um, who are designated unaccompanied get notices to appear at the border. Um, so that initiates immigration proceedings in all of their cases, right? So it's very rarely the case that you'll see an unaccompanied child who doesn't already have to defend themselves from deportation. Um, so what are the potential legal remedies for children? Um, this is something, um, especially if you intend to practice immigration law, um, you know, hopefully you will know all of this um, when you are evaluating a child's case. Um, so asylum, we all are probably familiar with asylum at a very generic level. You know, we hear about it in the news all the time. This is for people fleeing their countries because they fear threat um, to their life or some kind of danger. We have T visas, which refers to the trafficking visa, which I'll get into in a moment. The U visa, which is meant for victims of crime. Special immigrant juvenile status, which is a specific um, remedy that applies to children who can prove that they've been abandoned, abused, or neglected by one or both of their parents. Then we have the Violence Against Women Act, which I'm not going to go into detail today, um, but it, it's uh, VAWA. Um, it's usually for victims of abuse at the hands of a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident. Um, it's really something that could come into play as well um, on a child's case. And then we have, you know, another remedy that's referred to as prosecutorial discretion, but I would say, especially here in Atlanta, it's not something that we can rely on. Um, you know, for the most part, I understand that the Office of Chief Counsel that runs, um, you know, basically all the cases for the U.S. government in these cases, they're not really giving prosecutorial discretion like they once did, but it is something to be aware of. If you have like a very um, extreme case, you may want to consider asking for it anyway and developing a record for prosecutorial discretion. And then the last remedy that many of our children don't necessarily see as a remedy is voluntary departure. And that's for children who just don't have a legal remedy or a way to stay here and they want to clear their record. It's a very good remedy to doing just that. Um, hopefully making them eligible to come again in the future without penalties that would be involved with them having an order of removal. Now, asylum, in a nutshell, um, you know, again, I'm not going to go into too much of this, but, you know, if any of you take an immigration course or have taken immigration, you'll know that, you know, to prove asylum, you have to show past persecution or a well-founded fear of future persecution um, by the government or an actor that the government is unable or unwilling to control. And that persecution has to be based on one of the five protected grounds, which is internationally recognized, the race, religion, nationality, political opinion, a particular social group. I would say the majority of children's cases are going to fall in the particular category. 
just so that you understand where we're seeing um, the majority of their arguments. Now, common asylum fact patterns that we see for children are severe child abuse, um, resistance to or witness to gang activity, domestic violence, including gang related. So maybe, um, you know, you have a child client who's the girlfriend of a gang member, um, but within their domestic relationship, um, there's also domestic violence. Um, we also have family claims. Um, so children who may be targeted because somebody else in their family is targeted. Um, and then because things are always moving um, within this area, just that you know there have been some changes to asylum law in the last couple of years. And, you know, you want to pay attention to particularity and social distinction. And there are a couple of cases that I've listed on the slide that you might want to take a look at and read more thoroughly. Um, and again, for DV claims, that the nature of those types of cases has changed dramatically over the last few years with matter of AD. Um, and before that, matter of AD or CG. Um, so just understanding that there's a lot of dynamics at play. If you're trying to make these claims, you need to be very careful of like the current case law that's happening that's changing the, the ability to necessarily argue um, certain grounds. We also have family claims, and that was also impacted by matter of LEA um, just last year, one of the Attorney General's decisions. So, um, you know, taking a look at that. Um, we also have a third country transit bar that went into effect um, in the middle of last year. So, if you have any child who transited to a third country where they should have or could have sought asylum, you know, that might also have a really strong impact or interplay with their case. Um, credible fear standards have gone up, um, you know, so much harder now to establish this. And expedited removal is also something that's actually impacting so many people's ability to seek asylum, right? So before they even step into the country, they might be halted at, at our country's border, or before that through um, MPP. I'm sure many of you have heard of that as well. Um, and MPP stands for Migrant uh, Protection Protocols. And that's something that this administration has put into effect, with, whereby they've halted people, making them remain in Mexico to see the, you know, the conclusion of their immigration cases. Now, very important is to understand that there are very special rules that apply to UACs for asylum. Um, you know, where usually you're always kind of um, on edge about the one-year filing deadline for adults. That doesn't necessarily apply to unaccompanied minors. You under law, are able to apply for asylum beyond the one-year filing if you are a designated unaccompanied minor. Also, the Safe Third Country Bar does not apply to unaccompanied minors. So again, remember that designation that I was talking about. It's really important to keep that in mind. And also, if there is ever a time that somebody is arguing and winning an immigration court on that issue, you have to point the judge in the right direction on that issue. Then, um, sometimes, um, also, uh, something that we need to educate judges and others on is that the initial jurisdiction over an unaccompanied minor's claim is usually with the asylum office at USCIS and not the immigration court. So sometimes you have to request the court allow you the permission to go and apply with that office. Sometimes judges will also fight you know, back on that issue, but it's really important to um, take that um, stance and, and try your best to get that initial jurisdiction with the asylum office. Um, why? Because that experience of having your case heard um, puts you in, in a non-adversarial process where you go to an interview and you get to tell your story in a less um, adversarial setting. Um, and that also would provide the child with a second bite at the apple in immigration court if they should fail or the asylum officer doesn't agree that the child has asylum, then usually the child will have a second chance in the immigration court. Um, I'm going to keep going just in the interest of time. I want you to also take special note that last year, um, USCIS tried to put out something that's commonly referred to in immigration circles as a Lafferty memo. Um, this had to do with the UAC classification, um, and this actually is an ongoing litigation right now. That entire memo it has been blocked um, by a case that, at least in part, is being worked on by Kine and some of our partners nationally um, to stop this memo from fully taking effect. Um, partly because the way that this memo would work is that it would, it would really remove the protections of an unaccompanied status um, you know, for a child 
if any um, thing were to change. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but if you read that memo, you'll understand um, that you know it's basically trying to change the rules on the kids who previously had a chance to seek asylum before the asylum office. Now, two visa eligibility, and I'm going to go quickly because I know I'm running out of time. It's 10:35. Um, to be eligible for a T visa, you have to be present in the United States. So remember, I've mentioned before, a T visa is for victims of trafficking. You must be a victim of a severe form of trafficking. Uh, you also must have complied with reasonable requests for assistance uh, in investigating or prosecuting the case. And you also have to be able to prove extreme hardship um, if you were to be removed to your country of origin. Now, similar to asylum, there are special rules that apply with T visas. For instance, if you're a minor seeking um, trafficking, a trafficking visa, we don't have to have complied with um, any requests for assistance in investigation or prosecution because in, um, in the law, children are seen as exempt from this um, requirement. So while you still have to meet all of the other eligibility requirements, that one is a little bit more relaxed. I find that at least in the cases that we handle at kind, sometimes this is a non-issue because in most cases, the children are escaping from that trafficking and are usually reporting that anyway. So we are usually able to get um, you know, certification that they've been involved in assisting with the prosecution in any event. But it's important for especially really young kids that may not be able to do anything. Um, you know, maybe they can't testify. Maybe they don't have the competency to, like, be able to explain what happened to them. Um, you know, that's a really important provision under law. And if, remember, I alluded to the fact that it has to be an extreme form of trafficking. It has to be either sex trafficking or some form of labor trafficking to be recognized. Visa. And just remember that anyone under the age of 18 can consent uh, to a commercial sex act um, or any sex act for that matter that was put upon them by force, fraud, or coercion. Um, also, in labor trafficking, this is something that we definitely see a lot of, especially here in Georgia, um, children being trafficked for labor purposes. Um, you know, we see debt bondage, and voluntary servitude, penalty, and slavery. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact patterns that we've sometimes seen in our office in a moment. But it's really important to understand that in either case, you know, if it's being done by force, fraud, or coercion, if a child doesn't feel like they can say no to, um, you know, the, the labor that is being required of them, then you have to think in your mind as advocates, you know, is this a child that might qualify for a T visa? Now, we definitely have seen um, children who have been, you know, uh, forced to work for their caregivers. We've seen children who have been adopted, um, but maybe there's another unlawful purpose, or maybe it's in conjunction with the forced labor situation. Um, we've also seen sexual exploitation, especially, unfortunately, uh, many girls who end up in the hands of sponsors who, you know, promise the U.S. government that they will care for these children. Sometimes end up in situations where that very sponsor is um, sexually exploiting that young woman or that young man um, who's been released to their care. Interestingly, also here in the Southeast, we see sports related um, trafficking. Oftentimes, you know, a child will have been recruited from their country of origin, sometimes from Africa, from, sometimes from Europe um, or other places in the world, to play a sport here in the United States. You know, and promises that you know everything will be paid for or that they must pay to come for this opportunity. So, you know, I think it's just really important to make sure that if you see any of these things, any of these different fact patterns that you immediately think, you know, is this a child who might be the victim of the trafficking? Um, again, I'm not gonna go into too much further on trafficking. We're gonna move on to U visas. Um, U visas, again, as I mentioned before, are meant for children who are victims of crimes. Um, specific crimes that we'll get into in a moment. Um, they must have been a victim of a qualifying crime. They must have suffered some kind of substantial physical or mental harm as a result of being a victim. And it has to be, have been, is being, or is likely to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of the crime. So whereas in the T visa context there was an exemption, in the U visa context there is not. So even children have to certify, get a certification um, from law enforcement saying that they have been involved in the prosecution of the crime involved. 
Now, this is quickly just a list of different crimes um, that are specific for U visas. So, you know, for the most part, there are really creative arguments. So if there is a crime that maybe your child client, um, you know, was a victim of, but that's not on this list, you might want to see if it may be some could be argued within one other of these um, crimes that would be qualifying crimes. Um, so there are creative arguments that are always being um, formulated for this to expand the coverage of the U visa. Okay, some water for a second here. Now, I'm gonna move on. Um, I mentioned before that Many of the children that we see um, in our office are eligible for something called special immigrant juvenile status. Um, you know, I would say that for the most part, most unaccompanied minors are going to be eligible for this because usually the children can um, usually point to one or both parents who might be causing them abandonment, abuse, or neglect. It might be the very reason why they're here in the United States unaccompanied. So the eligibility criteria. Um, for SIJS, um, to be able to get SIJS, the child has to have been unmarried. Sometimes children may have been forced to marry at a young age, so it is important to note that you can actually, even in those cases, probably prove that it was non-consensual, that it shouldn't be considered uh, a marriage necessarily that was knowing and willing. So there are ways to argue against that if that's the case. Um, the child has to have has to be under the age of 21 at the time that they apply for SIJS. Um, but also, there, there's some complications because you're also going to need to get a state court order. So for many states in the country, including Georgia, some of um, the other states throughout the United States um, who don't have an extension of um, you know, being a minor um, beyond 18, that limit is 18 years old for the most part. I think um, maybe New York has extended, and Maryland um, you might be able to be beyond 18. Interestingly enough, Alabama, um, if you live in the state of Alabama, you might be able to get a COVID order um, for 2019. Um, so dependent on, um, we also have to show that the child was dependent on a juvenile court or, and that or is really important, as lawyers know, um, you must have been placed in the custody of an individual in accordance with state law. So one of two of those things have to happen. And it must not be viable to reunify with one or both of your parents because of, again, abuse, abandonment, neglect, or similar mistreatment under state law. And the child must show that it's not in their best interest to return to their country of origin. Now, all of these elements have to be reflected in the court order that you get usually from the state court in the jurisdiction where the child lives. Here in Georgia, um, you know, it is really important to understand that, you know, many courts in Georgia actually do um, often write into their order all of these required elements. But, you know, it's not always the case that state law um, fully meets um, sort of these federal definitions, right? So sometimes you have to ask a judge to do something that they might not feel comfortable with. For instance, not many state state court judges would be uh, comfortable necessarily with writing into their order. It's not in the best interest for this child to return to their country of origin if they feel unfamiliar with you know the country from which the child comes from, or if they believe that the child should go back to their country. Right. So there's a lot of um, implicit bias, biases, overt biases that can happen in um, trying to get a child's special immigrant juvenile status for, but for the most part. At least in the metro area, we haven't seen um, too much of those biases at play. But every now and then, um, in counties where maybe the judge just hasn't seen this kind of case before, you sometimes do encounter that. So it's important to know that that happens in every jurisdiction, even in California or New York. Um, I've heard from my colleagues that that's not something that's just um, here in the southeast. Um, so this chart is just to give you a sense of what um, is the pathway or the road to obtaining a residency for someone who is getting special immigrant juvenile status. That first step is going to the juvenile court, which you know I put juvenile court oh, uh, juvenile court in quotations on the next slide because really juvenile court is sort of a misnomer. It can be any court with jurisdiction over a child's custody and care. Um, so sometimes in our state, for instance, we do have juvenile courts, but it could involve the superior court, it could involve other courts. 
Then step two is to seek an SAJS petition with the appropriate agency, which is USCIS. And step three is hopefully eventually adjusting status um, to resident once um, you're able to do so under law. And I'll get into that in a moment. So there are many types of cases that lead to getting the order that I just described. Um, you know, in Georgia, the most common um, type of case is dependency within the juvenile court. However, like I mentioned, you get guardianship, you get custody, a modification of a prior order, registration of a foreign order, delinquency, adoption, all there are very many paths to getting the kind of order that you need um, to make the child eligible. But if you can't get any of these things, if you can't get any state court to give you an order that reflects all of those eligibility requirements that we just talked about a couple slides ago, then that child is not going to be able to seek SIJS because it's implicit within the law, it's explicit within the law, that you have to have, um, have a state court make these special findings of fact in order to be eligible. Now, that's why also, by the way, many um, practitioners like myself get very anxious about getting those orders um, as quickly as possible. Um, we don't want to, you know, do anything that would you know, risk a child being able to do this kind of case if they are eligible for it. Um, and then again, just putting the definition of a dependent child, at least under Georgia law, um, you know, every state has different laws that apply different definitions. In our state, it happens that our definition does fall more or less in line with what's required by the federal statutes for SIJS, so it is our advantage to use it. Again, I'm just going to put the slide up and you guys can read it a little bit more closely. Abandonment, abuse, and neglect, there are specific definitions under state law. It's very much dependent on where you live. Um, but just know that there are many different ways to argue one of these three claims in the case that you might be handling. State court process, um, understanding that you, know, you usually have to petition the court. There must be service on the parents or guardians of the child, um, sometimes in their home country, so that might cause you know, a little bit of a headache, but it is doable. There are many um, ways to get service accomplished in these countries, and there are actually nonprofit organizations that actually do that work, um, including Justice in Motion. Um, so take special note that it's not impossible to do this. Um, people do it all the time. I mean, we, we do it even within our office. We're able usually to get um, consent orders from parents and home country um, signed by them. Um, and, you know, then the next step is after services performed, going in front of the state court judge, having a full hearing. Sometimes this involves testimony from the child, sometimes just the sponsor, sometimes both. And then hopefully at the end of that process, you're going to be getting that order with all of those special findings of fact that we were talking about. Once you have that, going to USCIS, the slide is really just some basic instructions on like what is required to be um, included in that application. Step three, um, as I mentioned before, is adjustment of status to legal residency. Now, the unfortunate thing is that um, for SIJS, it is actually considered an employment-based visa. And for many of you that work um, in the immigration spectrum and field, um, you probably have heard of the visa bulletin. Um, as of you know, almost four years ago now, we have to pay special attention to the visa bulletin um, because every year um, we have seen that you know, there's an oversubscription of people trying to get residency through SIJS. Um, so here um, is just so that you can see what that visa bulletin looks like. You actually have to look at the special chart that um, relates to employment-based visas, look at the fourth preference, which is what applies in SIJS, um, and you'll see um, that while many countries are listed as current, that means anybody from those countries can immediately apply for status for the Northern Triangle region. We have a long wait time that's been created. So remember I mentioned an oversubscription, and around four years ago it was 2016. So we're seeing children that applied for SIJS in 2016 only now become eligible to seek residency as a result of the approval of that application, right? So it's a little bit, um, I always like to 
describe it as Alice in Wonderland. You have to keep track of all these things and things don't seem um, that straightforward. And this is one area where that's not straightforward, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Um, just know that if you do work with an SAJS client and you don't really understand any of this, you definitely want to get mentored through understanding this part of it, especially. And I know Kind has put out a number of um, practice advisories, as does AILA, as does any organization that um, you know, understands sort of the, the nature of the visa bulletin. We at Kind um, always have to monitor the changes that are constantly being announced that affect all of these applications for SIJS. Um, so we do that regularly. Um, we put out Kind advisories all of the time. Um, so you know, it's infrequently the case that a month will go by without a practice advisory coming out from Kind, you know, just to help practitioners and especially Kind um, volunteers understand what what is happening and might impact their case that they're working on. Um, and you know, if you're working on a kind case as a volunteer um, or as a direct rep attorney, you know, we're always available to those who volunteer with us to answer questions as they go. Um, I know we're running out of time, but quickly I'm just gonna say there are specific considerations in working with children that we have to keep in mind. Um, you know, Working with child migrants is definitely um, a specialization and something that um, you know many people need to understand. Um, children are children, <laughs> first and foremost, right? Um, and yet, I think when we work with unaccompanied minors, we, we look at this chart often um, to, to understand that they are children first, immigrants because of the nature of their story, and they're also usually trauma survivors. So they're usually at the intersection of all three of these um, groupings and, and there's a lot of interplays that go on in that child's life and ability, right, to express themselves um, depending on, on how um, they cope with their trauma, how evolved are they with expressing themselves just as children, um, you know, and then the additional um, hurdle of, you know, having gone through the immigration process and, and having to have survived that as well. Um, so at time we like to talk about pillars of representation, we always have to be um, very careful to maintain confidentiality. Also, communication is key. Patience is also something that we really have to um, own, I think, as practitioners. And then we at Kind take an express wishes approach. So sometimes you'll hear a lot of the time, best interest of the child, right? Um, that's usually something that, that especially Child Protective Services applies in their approach. You know, it's not only about what the children want, it's about what the best interest is. And usually they'll put the best interest above all else. We do, um, you know, recognize there is best interest analysis involved in all of our cases, but we try as best as possible to maintain the express wishes of the children. Communication is always key. We can't avoid lapses in contact with the clients. When they contact you, you have to contact them right back. They're children, so they really need as much contact and communication as possible about their case. Um, repeating things is really important just so that they fully understand what's happening at every step of the way. Um, you know, really, we um, ask our volunteers to do uh, periodic check ins that are scheduled with their uh, client because sometimes if you have you know, lapsed in your communication with the children. You know, our children are part of a population that sometimes, you know, frequently change their phone numbers, are easy to really just, you know, sometimes, you know, be unable to reach at some point during the, the course of the representation. So it's really important to maintain regular contact. Another thing to be careful with is the effective use of an interpreter. So there's two layers to it. You're working with an interpreter and you're working with a child to so making sure that you understand the dynamics and, and honing again that skill of how to do that. There are best practices, you know, always start your case early. Um, never wait for immigration court hearings to get started. There's a lot of things that you can do to advance the case before you even get to court, um, at least especially in the cases when it relates to children. Um, you know, maintaining a good working relationship with us is important. So just to kind of get back to that, you know, we have a very specific model this is sort of to lay out for everyone. Um, what does KIND do? What does the pro bono attorney volunteer do? As I mentioned before, you know, pro bono um, attorneys are really charged with, you know, really being the leaders of the case. They are the ones that make decisions in consultation closely with, with their child client. We are there to consult, to answer questions, to help facilitate 
and strengthen the case in whatever way we can. Um, and that includes through non-legal supports, so, such as the social service um, process that I was talking about before. Our coordinators will help the children find resources whenever necessary. We also have a small emergency fund per office, so we are able to especially help the children in emergency situations when needed, um, things of that nature. But our primary role is to help um, mentor, provide um, strategy, provide samples, and also editing drafts is something that we commonly do um, day in, day out in our office. Um, now, important to remember across the board, no one has the right to appoint a counsel in immigration court, whether you're still or whether you're a child. But the child, again, is five times more likely to obtain relief from deportation if they have somebody representing them. So it's really important that children be represented in their immigration case. Um, you know, the law isn't designated to accommodate children's needs. And if you ever go to immigration court, you can see how difficult of an environment it is for children to understand, you know, sitting with a headset on, trying to understand what's happening to them in particular. It's a very impersonal thing and experience for any adult. Imagine being a child in that setting. Um, there's a lot of high stakes, as I mentioned before, if a child is returned to their home country, and if that, you know, situation is dangerous for them, you know, sometimes a removal order is the same as a death sentence, and that is, can't say that enough, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. You know, we've seen instances where children have returned just to be executed by a local gang or just to be, um, you know, hurt so badly by their abusing relative that they, you know, unfortunately we've seen situations where children have died as a result of a deportation order. Um, you know, for, from our perspective, this is the most rewarding work that we can do. Um, so we hope that, you know, It'll never be the case that we will not be able to find a willing and capable volunteer to take on these cases. So that is the work that we do um, every day at time. I'm just going to put my um, contact information if you actually email um, info at Lana. I actually have access to that box. Um, anybody in our office can see any um, email that you might send. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, um, like I said before, we have plenty of materials um, on advocacy, on um, other ways to engage. Um, if you can't take a case, or maybe you're not ready to take a case yet if you're in school, there's plenty of other things that can be done. So please visit our website, and you can follow us on any of these um, social media platforms. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks so much, right. Christina. This was a yeah. wonderful presentation um, for, for all of our attendees today. Um, we do have a couple minutes if anyone wanted to ask a question for Christina. And I could stay on as long as needed for questions. I apologize that that went a little over time. No, oh, no, it was a very robust presentation. Does anyone have a question? You, you can go unmute or type it in the um, chat box. I guess maybe I'll I'll ask a question of everyone. I don't know. Has anyone um, that's I guess on this chat participated or has done any work with an unaccompanied minor in any of their cases before? I'm assuming no. Has anybody worked with any children in immigration? Oh, sorry. Um, I actually I actually interned at Kind four years ago at the oh, New York wonderful. office. Oh, yeah. that's great. <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. Well, yeah, I hope that is at Tahrey this summer, so we're we're excited to have him. That's fantastic. Jeff, I hope that um, the presentation was more or less in line with what you already knew and wasn't too boring for you. <laughs> Honestly, I, I didn't really understand. I think the first time that I saw some of this, I, I understood maybe 2% of it, and now I maybe understand, honestly, maybe 20% of it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a reason why I think this area of law is specialized, right? There, there's so many different layers involved. And, you know, to be able to spot the issues, I mean, I'm sure you guys are probably getting inundated with issue spotting in school and whatnot, but it's it's really part of the, the work, right? It's when you're, um, you know, interviewing a child and trying to find out the details of their story. The way I like to sort of approach 
an interview is just to tell the child, like, I'm here to listen to your whole story from beginning to end as if it was like a novel or a movie. Um, so I need to understand what you went through. And sometimes I might ask you to explain something to me so I understand everything. But imagine, you know, a child is giving you their life story and it's trying to like find and locate where in that story might any of these remedies actually assist this child, right? And it's terrible that we often like are looking for the worst situations first, um, but that that's our role as advocates is to try to figure out like, have they been traumatized? Have they been abused? Um, and, and it's a lot to, to try to wrap your head around. So until you are able to issue spot all of those things, it, it really is hard to also not get swept away in the story. The children have such fascinating situations. They've overcome so much. And, you know, I often tell our kids, like, you know, you guys are the bravest people, right? Like, you've gone through so much. Um, and to emphasize with them that, you know, they are really going to be the ones that um, determine their future, um, you know, despite everything that might be happening with, with the case. So any questions? I mean, I'm happy to talk about anything at all. Like, um, doesn't have to be related to the presentation. Anything that you want to know and curious questions about the work about what you're doing now, um, how this might interplay with what you're doing. Um, I actually have a question, Christina. Um, uh, so when I I actually applied to law school and talked a lot about my like the experience that I had at Kind, and and we talked about um, at the time there was legislation in Congress to guarantee counsel for kids, um, and yes. it didn't go anywhere, right? Yes. Um, and obviously the situation, the political situation is not better now, obviously, but I was wondering if like there's still advocacy. To there is. Yeah. Now, every year our advocacy team actually tries to find, you know, a different um, member of Congress who might be willing to reintroduce the same legislation. So there's sort of a drumbeat on that issue um, that we try to keep going, right? So it doesn't matter if it didn't go anywhere last year, it's going to be reintroduced at some point somewhere. Um, and, you know, I think even despite the change in administration um, and the chances of it going somewhere are not good, um, that's still a constant um, work that's being done. It's one of our top issues always, um, because I think until it's really in the law that every child should have counsel appointed to them, like we haven't won yet, right? So that's, that's going to be a continual um, advocacy piece that we work on. That is something that states and localities are starting to address universal rep. It hasn't happened uh, here, but like states like um, I think Oregon and Pennsylvania, um, there is Even a New York. Yeah. <laughs> where, I mean, there is a movement here, and I'm sure um, you know folks that are here over the summer um, will be hearing about it. So um, it's in the works because we do have. Um, you know, a mayor, um, Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta, who ended the contract with ICE for the, the you know, the detention center, the, jail, the local jail that was used as ICE detention. Um, she doesn't have a 287G agreement, with, you know, said that, you know, without a warrant, they're not going to detain folks. It's, um, so there is hope and momentum here because yeah. of you know, the amazing immigrant rights community we have with folks like Christina and a lot of the folks that are presenting as a part of this series this week are, are in that movement. Um, well, I know we're at time. Um, Christina has and, and her colleagues at KIND, uh, Fatima and Maria and Roy, they are always um, more than willing to help provide technical assistance to us. I mean, right now, because of um, the Remain in Mexico slash MPP policy. At Tahere, we've seen an influx of young women and girls coming in, um, and we're trying to kind of work with them and get, we have one uh, um, uh, asylum case that we're sending to USIS, and I just emailed Fatima and Maria uh, about, about that. So they are definitely a, a huge resource for us in this community as we all try to do this work for this vulnerable population. So I just want to thank you, Christina, and I know um, we'll we'll get to see more of you this summer. Um, but this was a great presentation, and um, we look forward to collaborating more in the future. Well, at the very least, I hope that it was inspiring in some 
play at some level in whatever advocacy that you are doing already or that you choose to do in the future. So hopefully you've been armed with a few additional tools through the, this presentation. So thank you all for participating today.